I, I consistently started getting better. I did some, like I said, speech therapy, cardiac therapy. I was a nurse practitioner. I'd gotten my degree at UC Davis. I went back to the faculty at UC Davis and I asked them, can I sit in class again? Can I just sit in class and listen? So you could resorb what you already knew. Totally got back into that. I have one of my best friends, Dr. Dan Fields, and I were in co-practice. He brought me back in and oh, so gently, I started seeing patients again. Really simple things. He walked Walked me through. We went through. So it was a process. So after about two years, I was feeling much better, much Mm -hmm. better. I really, and I thought if I really want to get my brain back, I should go back to school. That's it. I'll go back to school. So I live very close to Sacramento State University. They have a school of nursing there. They had a master's degree you could earn there. So I went back to Sac State Mm -hmm. and earned my master's. And I was very interested in looking at had other people who had gone through death events or sudden death events and survived. Had they gone through, again, like I said, the depression, the anxiety, the fear, the anger, all that, you know, spiritual shift, all that. So I got my master's and that was my master's thesis was to look at that. And I started seeing patterns in people. But one of the things I started seeing in terms of patterns was not only in the research I did, but also when I started, to, I was seeing patients as a nurse practitioner, I could recognize people who went through really tough stuff not overnight, but over time, not only did they survive, but they actually thrived and not in spite of what happened, but as a direct result. And I was fascinated by that aspect of human behavior. Mm -hmm. So when our children got older and a couple went to college and our last one was gone, I thought, you know what? I really want to study this in earnest. I'm going to attach a degree to it. So I went back to get my doctorate. It was kind of keeping in mind we're only a couple years out of an incredibly traumatic event. <laughs> yeah, that yeah. To, to rebuild, you're in your late thirties now. Right, right. Well, I was probably by that time I was in my early forties at that time. Yeah, yeah, Uh-oh, yeah. Forties, yeah, yeah, you yeah, crossed yeah, the yeah, decade. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. but no. But the other thing too is um, I was teaching at this one university part time. And I had some really cool colleagues. And lots of times we were just bouncing around ideas about, you know, patients and behaviors. And we'd talk about what happened to me. And I kept saying, you know, there's something beyond rehab. There's something beyond. People go way beyond rehab. They go way beyond the, you know, and and they... They don't always, they don't look the same. They don't even sound the same. They're better. And so we started, I go. In spite of the trauma. Oh, it's a direct result of it. Yes, uh, yes. a direct result yes. of it. And so I was kicking around some ideas, but I need a different word. Rehab, it's so minimal, you know? And so one time a friend of mine said, hey, what about meta? Like going above and beyond. I go, Yes. And so I took the word meta and I matched it with habilitation, Mm -hmm. restoration, habilitation. So I said, I'm just going to make up a new word for what people do all the time. People have done this for centuries. They meta habilitate. They go above and beyond restoration. Mm -hmm. So while I had this in my head and was thinking about it and ruminating over it, that's when I was going back to get my doctorate. And I really wanted to study that in earnest. So it took me five years. I was in doctoral studies for five years, finished my finished my dissertation and my dissertation was specifically looking at the notion of metahab what is behind it, how I had the greatest dissertation chair, uh, Dr. Dean Elias. 
And I remember saying, I want to interview people, and I, I know people do this all the time, and I want to interview people, and I want to know why they did this. Why did they go above and beyond? And he said to me, it was like perfect. He said, well, you kind of want to know why, but that's really motivation, and motivation can change over time. What you want to know is, how did they do it? Mm-hmm. And I went, oh, my gosh, that's right. That's right. So I had very open-ended interviews with people who had gone through, you know, gentlemen who had gone through concentration camps in Nazi Germany and had immigrated to finally the England and then to the U.S. and had a life here. And, you know, got a young guy who had a spinal cord injury. Uh, he was playing rugby at UC Berkeley and coming back from that. And a woman who had had breast cancer in her early 30s with really tough stuff. Mm -hmm. And so I not only asked them about their event and the aftermath and kind of just let them talk about it, but I also looked a little bit into their background. Who were their family? How did they grow up? That kind of stuff, which was super interesting. But as I was listening to story after story or experience after experience, I started recognizing they didn't do this in a haphazard way. You could really identify a system here. They kind of went through this, and then they did that, and then they came so out. So there's and a repetitive pattern with each one of them. You really, when you start to listen, you could see they they did this, in, and it is over time, but 100%, you could see how they move through when one thing organically almost led to another mm-hmm. stage and those types of things. So um, chatting with a colleague of mine at Sac State, uh, Dr. Louise Timmer, I was telling her about that. And she goes, you know what? Sounds like there's stages. And I said, oh, my gosh. Yes, there are stages to metahab. So I went back into my research, went back into behavioral science, went back into cognitive behavioral therapy, went back into all that, and I clearly identified six stages of metahab. So today's language, it's PTSD or post-traumatic stress disorder. Something Mm -hmm. happens that causes, and that can be significant in the general term, but significant is relative to the individual. Loss of a job, a marriage. Oh, yes. Those could be PTSD events. Mm-hmm. Obviously, first responders, the cumulative effect of these, right. you know, what they see on a day-to-day basis. The, the significance really is relative to the individual. So people that we're speaking with who are in a position of understanding that they have a heart condition that could quite possibly be fatal, Mm-hmm. They don't know. They don't know what the right. the next step is going to be for them. Or post surgery, they've they've had. In our case, it's called the unroofing procedure, where the mm. the artery is is unroofed from the tissue of the heart. And, well, now what? What can I do? What am I? Yes, my life has changed forever. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. How? Mm-hmm. So that PTSD event is what you're you're describing in so many cases and incidents. But something happens after. PTSD to the term post traumatic growth, if I'm not mistaken, right? right? Or right. PTG. You're right. And and you've now somewhat codified the process for post traumatic growth. Right. So I did not come up with the term post traumatic growth. That came up with Dr. Lawrence Calhoun and Richard Tedeschi from University of North Carolina. And they have a thing called the five domains of post-traumatic growth. Mm -hmm. And again, it's really important to know, and this can be whether you're doing cardiac rehab, you know, whatever kind of rehab you're doing as you're coming back. One of the things I have come to understand with PTG is one must engage in the process for it to happen. Mm -hmm. So if you're after cardiac surgery or after a cardiac event or whatever, and you are choosing therapies to engage in, it is the engagement with that that is going to bring your results. So as I have a course at Sac State 
called Traumatology, an Introduction to Post-Traumatic Growth. That's based over all of this. Mm -hmm. And I tell my students this. So as an example, if you want to get stronger biceps, you cannot just sit around hoping and wishing that you're (laughs) going to get stronger biceps. You must engage in the process to get those, to do the weights, to do them so often, to do whatever pattern you want to get into. So the same thing with post-traumatic growth. It doesn't just occur, or even if it does, you're not even going to be aware of it unless you purposefully engage in the process. And I think that's a really important message because In the aftermath of what people go through, and there's various levels, and sometimes people say, well, I don't know if it's traumatic. Well, let's just call it a significant adversity or a significant life challenge. Same thing. Unless you enter into actively being engaged in the process of your healing, of your the work you want to do to get better. It's not going to happen. Mm-hmm. And that is also for the people around you, wives and husbands and children. They need to be engaged in the process of how do we look at things now? How do we see each other now? Mm-hmm. What does our family look like now? And at the end of the day, or at the end of several months, or even you, many times people will look back on this and say, we're so much stronger. 